Norman Davies questions the Soviets' role in Hitler's defeat. He chronicles World War II, focusing on the European arena, and challenges what he considers generally accepted facts of the war. His talk from the L.A. Public Library is an hour 15 minutes. For a great introduction to Norman Davies' work, consider this review by scholar Anne Applebaum of Davies' monumental Europe, a history, and I mean monumental, um, written for the Evening Standard in 1996. The Allied scheme of history promotes a number of assumptions. The belief that the Atlantic community is the pinnacle of progress, the demonization of everything German, an indulgent view of the Tsarist Empire, and even the Soviet Union, at least in its wartime role, acceptance of Europe's division as natural. Powerful though these prejudices may be, Davies ridicules their historical basis so thoroughly that it seems surprising no one else has thought to do it before. After all, we live in an era of hyper-historical consciousness. In recent years, women have been discovered. The history of the lower classes has been unearthed. The stories of slaves and chambermaids have been published to great acclaim. But if our geographical prejudices have remained intact, Norman Davies, one of Britain's most underappreciated historians, was precisely the man to dissect them. His own family is Welsh, his wife's from what is now Ukraine, and he is a British scholar whose history of Poland has become, in translation, the standard text in many Polish schools. With ties and interests on Europe's peripheries, he has long been critical of the way European history has come to mean the history of England, France, Germany, and Italy." End quote. So for those of you who've been watching uh, Ken Burns' documentary, The War, um, which is fine, and with all of its uh, great uh, publicity campaign, here's a challenge from Norman Davies to reconsider what you really know about World War II and how that received wisdom might be biased or even incorrect. In his new book, No Simple Victory, World War II in Europe, 1939 to 1945, Davies poses simple questions that have complicated and unexpected answers. Norman Davies' numerous historical works, including Rising 44, The Battle for Warsaw, Microcosm, A Portrait of a Central European City, Heart of Europe, The Past and Poland's Present, The Isles, A History, and Europe, A History, and God's Playground, A History of Poland. He is supernumerary fellow at Wolfson College, Oxford, and is a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and Professor Emeritus at London University. It is indeed a great honor to wel welcome Norman Davies to the Los Angeles Public Library. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for those kind words. I'm very pleased to be back in Los Angeles. Um, I first came here, I think, 30 years ago when I was about so big. Um, in case some of you think I have a rather large tumor on the chest, um, I was looking at myself in the, the mirror behind there, uh, waiting for the introduction uh, to finish. Um, I have a uh, wireless mic here in my pocket and I shall try and uh, cover it by uh, my arms. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, my latest book, uh, No Simple Victory. Uh, the British edition was called uh, Europe at War, 1939-45 and as a subtitle, No Simple Victory. And the American publishers in New York decided to turn it round, and they've made it into simple, uh, No Simple Victory, World War II in Europe. And I think, uh, I think that's right and proper. I, I think uh, uh, I prefer it that way around. Some of you will have seen the TV series, or the beginning of the TV series, The War, directed by Ken Burns. Um, I've not seen it, although I did see an interview 
with Ken Burns when I was in New York last week uh, and uh, heard him explaining uh, what he was uh, aiming to do by expanding uh, history from the bottom up. History as seen through the uh, experiences and the reminiscences of uh, American veterans who took part in the war and, of course, in the, the war effort at home. Uh, I rather like that introduction. Uh, I could see uh, that he knew what he was doing and um, I myself have advocated this sort of uh, approach to military history, which always used to be uh, taught from the top down, namely the historians imagined that they were the generals sitting with their maps and they were moving the, the armies around and the poor guys who were actually doing the fighting hardly got a say in the story. However, Burns' uh, series, like many others, uh, is exclusively confined to the, Ameri the American perspective, to that part of the Second World War in which the US took part. Uh, and my book and what I shall say this evening uh, is about the other 80% of the story, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, in which neither the British or the Americans had any uh, prominent part. And the proportions of the war, especially in Europe, <coughs> are especially important. <coughs> I know that here in, uh, in LA, we're on the shores of the Pacific, and that the, the war was fought in two theaters, in the Pacific and in Europe. And the US had a specially difficult task in fighting these two separate wars at the same time. Uh, I was in Harvard last week, and uh, in one of the, uh, the commentaries after my presentation, uh, Professor Richard Pipes uh, got up and, and spoke. And one of the things he said that for us, meaning the Americans, uh, the war against Japan was the more important. I imagine that is how you see it here in in Los Angeles uh, and um, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, however, because of, partly be because of the, uh, the great burden of the Pacific War, the American participation in Europe was much smaller than uh, it usually allowed for. Uh, and I hope to give some facts and figures which will, uh, will, will back that up. Before I go any further, I'm going to ask you three questions. I won't provide the answers, which are a bit tricky. Uh, but um, in case you want to go to sleep when I continue to draw on, you can at least think about these questions. Uh, the first one is about battles, the biggest and most decisive battles of the war in Europe. Where in that long list of big and decisive battles would you put Operation Overlord, i.e. D-Day and the Normandy landings? Do you think that would be the largest battle or the, mo the most decisive? Or would it be number two? Or would it be number three? Or number four? Number five? 
Just think where it is on that scale of size and importance. The second question, can you name the largest concentration camp that was operating in Europe in 1939 to 45? Simple question. The third one, not so simple, can you name the nationality which lost the largest number of civilians uh, in the war in Europe? I'll move on. I won't give you any hints. <laughs> Briefly about the, the war itself. Uh, the, the war went through three phases. 1939 to 41, 41 to 44, and then the final phase in uh, 19, from June 1944 until the end in May 1945. And I'll try and say a word about each. <coughs> uh, but I'll start, as one should do, with the beginning, with the outbreak of the war in September 1939. Not incidentally, as almost all Russians would say, and many Americans, not in 1941. The war started on the 1st of September 1939 at 4.45 in the morning when the German army crossed the frontiers of Poland. And a few days later, the Red Army uh, crossed the eastern frontier of Poland and uh, the two invaders met in the middle. Uh, however, before that, the war was only made possible by a secret agreement between these two uh, the two largest combatant powers, the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. The 23rd of August 1939, uh, the German Foreign Minister Robin von Ribbentrop flew to Moscow and signed what we know as the Nazi-Soviet Pact and its secret protocols. And essentially this was an arrangement where the two parties, not just one party, not just Hitler, but the two parties would not interfere with each other when they attacked their respective neighbors. Uh, this is important because uh, the conventional story has it that the, the Soviet Union, the biggest combatant power of them all, uh, was neutral. It wasn't neutral. Stalin participated in the initial agreement uh, that made the war possible and he participated in uh, some of the biggest campaigns at the beginning of the war. We even know uh, what Stalin had in mind in signing the Nazi-Soviet Pact. The agenda, the minutes of uh, a meeting of the Politburo on the 9th, 19th of October, no, sorry, 19th of August, 1939, are now known. And essentially, <coughs> Stalin was calculating that if he made this arrangement with Hitler, Hitler would become embroiled with the Western powers, there would be a war in the West uh, in which uh, the capitalist enemy, as he saw it, would uh, the capitalist rivals, the Third Reich and um, uh, France and Britain, uh, would be uh, caught up in a long war. They would slog it out, and the Soviet Union would benefit uh, by 
uh, not being involved and would then be able to exploit the situation. In other words, from the start, <coughs> the Soviet Union was engaged uh, and um, uh, in the first place, Stalin and Hitler were in agreement that the Western powers, the democracies, should be removed from the scene before anything else happened. Now, the first uh, phase of the war I began to talk about, 39 to 41. In those two years, <coughs> the Germans attacked eight countries in all, and Stalin, the Soviet Union, attacked five countries. Uh, generally speaking, Hitler was far more successful uh, than Stalin. Uh, uh, Poland was knocked out in 1939. In May, June 1940, in a similar period of time, both Britain and France were knocked out of the reckoning. Uh, and Hitler was far more successful than his wildest dreams uh, might have uh, led him to believe. Stalin, on the other hand, met with catastrophe. The Red Army invaded Finland. Uh, if ever you want to uh, disprove the story that uh, the, the Soviet Union was neutral the, in the first place, more than a million men were poured into Finland uh, and the Red Army took a beating. Uh, little Finland didn't collapse. Uh, it kept fighting throughout the winter of 39 to 40, uh, and it only uh, was made to, to, um, to accept a, uh, a peace uh, uh, after Easter in 1940, when the sheer numbers began to tell. Um, uh, in those years, end of 39, 40, 41, Hitler and Stalin were working together. Uh, the Soviet Union was supplying oil for the, uh, for the Wehrmacht in the West. Uh, the two sides were exchanging prisoners. Um, uh, the Gestapo was handing over um, uh, people that the, the, uh, the Stalin's regime wanted, Ukrainians and, uh, and so on, and Stalin was handing over German communists <laughs> for the uh, Gestapo to deal with. It was not a formal alliance, but a partnership. Everything changed, however, in the second phase, June 1941, when the two partners... Um, uh, jumped at each other's throats. The Germans invaded the Soviet Union, not incidentally Russia. Russia was a thousand miles from where that, that war began. Uh, and uh, there started the biggest military conflict uh, in European history, if not in world history. Uh, the German-Soviet war on the Eastern Front was many times greater than any of the uh, other campaigns of the war, in fact, of all the other campaigns of the war put together. Uh, Eighty percent, according to German records, 80 percent of German losses were um, inflicted in the East. And the implication is that there was only 20% of the German, uh, German losses to be accounted for by the Western powers. And at a rough guess, I think the British might claim 5%, the Americans might claim 10 or 15%. Uh, but this is the, of course, in crude numbers, the proportions of the <coughs> of the uh, east and the west. The third phase 
comes after three years when the German army is already, if not um, defeated, is retreating and is in uh, serious trouble. The Western armies land in Normandy at a time when the, in the summer of 1944, the Red Army is already poised to attack Berlin. We know of a, a document, a plan, submitted to Stalin by his two leading marshals, Rokossovsky and Zhukov. Uh, in, it's the 8th of August, 1944, to capture Warsaw and to drive straight for Berlin. Uh, we know that Stalin didn't accept it, although we don't know for certain why. Uh, but my guess is that Stalin realized he'd so much time to spare over the Western armies in the, uh, coming from the opposite direction that he could spend the next five or six, seven months conquering all the co uh, countries of Eastern Europe before the British and the Americans uh, even uh, began to come over the horizon, and that's what he did. Uh, it's also true that the Western armies made much slower progress than expected. Uh, they broke out of Normandy at the end of July 1944. They didn't cross the Rhine, you know, the famous bridge at Remagen, into the uh, the center of Germany until March 1945. In other words, this is eight months. It took them eight months to cross France and get into Germany. And in that time, Stalin had overrun half the continent. And it was only at a very late stage in April 1945 that the Americans and the and the Soviets came together on the Elbe. Uh, the finale uh, came as a surprise, I think, to everybody. The expectation had been that the armies of East and West would pincer the Reich from either side and then would join together and crush the life out of the fascist beast as the saying went. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, at the last moment in March 1945, uh, when the uh, battle for ba Berlin was looming, General Eisenhower decided that U United States troops would not take part. Uh, the reason for this was fairly ob obvious, it was Japan. The Americans couldn't afford to lose hundreds of thousands of men storming Berlin because these men were needed in the, in the East. In other words, the Western powers had joined too late with too little forces to play the decisive role. Uh, I know I say that their participation was insignificant but the proportions are clear. In military terms, it was the Red Army that won the war in Europe uh, and not the Western democracies. And the, fin the final showdown in Berlin was performed by the Red Army alone. And they were willing, through Stalin's ruthless approach, to lose 300,000 ma men in that one battle, i.e. more men than the British and the Americans lost in Europe in the whole of the war. That's just a, a quick narrative. Let me talk now briefly um, about three key words that we mention. Um, uh, 
One is victory. What do we mean by victory? Uh, one is military triumph, the defeat of the enemy. Uh, and there's no doubt our enemy, the Third Reich, was defeated. It was finished off. But in other fields, such as the political field, there was no clear victory. The Soviet Union was as hostile to Western democracy as the Third Reich had been. And at the end of the war, it wasn't democracy that triumphed. It was, a, if you like, a, uh, an impasse. Democracy triumphed in one half of Europe, and uh, Stalinist communism, mass-murdering tyranny, triumphed in the other half. Uh, and there's al also this moral aspect of victory. If uh, a mass murdering tyranny um, achieves the prime result at the end of the war, then you can't say that freedom, justice and democracy uh, triumphed because they didn't. They half triumphed, but the real victor was, uh, in Europe at least, um, Stalin and Stalin's hateful system. And this brings me to the second key word, the good war. Uh, uh, very popular, I'm sure it will be repeated very often in Ken Burns' series. Uh, the war can be seen as a good war if you simply look at that sector in which we were involved. But if you take the, the bigger picture, the war is not between good and evil or guys fighting for freedom and liberation. It's be the war is being fought between two colossal tyrannical mo uh, monsters tearing the, the guts out of each other on the, on the Western Front. And irrespective of which of them had won, there would have been no good result because uh, neither uh, Hitlerism or Stalinism uh, would fit the category of a good victor triumphing of uh, evil. And lastly, liberation. Uh, how often do we hear that Europe was liberated? Europe was half liberated. And I would suggest less than half liberated. Uh, let me try give you one graphic ex example and then I'll ask for questions. We've all seen the terrible, in some ways, um, um, hopeful pictures of the liberation of Auschwitz. Handfuls of survivors, among them lots of children, twins. You've probably seen these terrible pictures of the twins that have been kept alive for experiments, crowding up to the, the barbed wire, filmed by Red Army uh, cameramen who had just broken into the, uh, into the camp. That was undoubtedly a liberation. No two ways about it. However, what was going on at the same time? The, those Red Army soldiers who liberated Auschwitz were fighting the surface of a regime which had bigger concentration camps than Auschwitz and a system of camps which had started a lot earlier and went on a lot longer. Uh, so what sort of liberation was it? Uh, one uh, cohort of prisoners, if they survived, was released to be, to replace, be replaced by others. Uh, 
several of the Nazi concentration camps were used by Stalin's uh, police at the end of the war to collect new people who were um, uh, to be taken out of circulation. And to my mind, this is, a, uh, is symptomatic of the overall situation in Europe. It's a bit complicated. There was a process of liberation going on simultaneously as a process of enslavement. And that's the reason why I call my book No Simple Victory. Thank you. Um, I will, the, the light's in my face. Yes, sir, I can... Yes. <clears throat> One of the most outstanding World War II things that we've seen on TV was by the BBC, The World at War, a long, long series that actually interviewed the people that had been seen in war pictures, one kind or another, and gave their opinions. And I just wondered what your opinion was of that series. Um. I believe it was in the 1970s, it was about 30 years yes. ago, and to be fair, it wasn't the BBC, it was um, ITV, i.e. The, the independent um, television channel, but it came out of London, I, I agree. Um, well, I, I don't think that series has been bettered. Uh, it was very comprehensive. Uh, I think uh, that series showed the Eastern Front more fully than uh, anything uh, before or since. Um, uh, I can't remember in detail uh, um, uh, all the many episodes. There were something like, was it 30 or 35 episodes? It was a huge, huge undertaking. Um, and. Uh, yes, you know, if, if I had to recommend, it, uh, recommend a television series, that's, that's what it would be. Uh, but even so, um, on this question of balance, uh, I think you'll find it in, in uh, that series. The, the impression is given is that the Western powers and the, the, the Soviet Union in the East uh, join forces and Together they crushed the Third Reich. That's true, but the implication is that it's sort of 50-50. Uh, and I'm suggesting that the balance is rather less than 50-50. Um, and one can talk for ages. Um, what was the uh, impact of the Western bombing offensive, for example? There was no equivalent in, 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 the, in the East or... Um, the question of intelligence or the, the, the war at sea and all, all these things. Um, but however you uh, add up the, uh, uh, the balance, it seems to me that uh, the true victor of the war was in the East and the victor was up to no good. <laughs> so. Why, why do you think that the Germans cho uh, chose to follow uh, the, uh, Napoleon as it were in invading Russia as opposed to attacking the um, British areas in the Mediterranean, the Middle East? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't think there's much puzzle about that. The Soviet Union was the biggest military power. Um, uh, certainly in, in, in numbers, uh, it had by far the biggest army from the beginning, uh, about four times as big as the American army in Europe, incidentally. Um, and 
uh, it was thought to be very poorly organized uh, and the, the general expectation is, was in 1941 that the Red Army won't last for more than a few weeks. So it was very tempting. Uh, in order to um, win domination of the whole of Europe, which is obviously what Hitler was aiming at, he had to knock out the biggest rival, and that was the Soviet Union. Uh, he'd all, already almost knocked out the United Kingdom. We were hanging on by our fingernails. We, we, we'd lost all offensive capacity. We had a big navy, but you can't invade Germany with a battleship. Uh, you know, uh, we had an air force which um, performed extremely well in 1940, but. Uh, uh, it was a long time before we were able uh, even to drop bonds on Germany in an effective way. Um, uh, so the, the, the real, um, the biggest adversary for the Third Reich was always going to be the Soviet Union. There was no other way to supremacy without the Germans destroying that. Yes, sir, on this side. We know that uh, Stalin agitated for a second front with Churchill and Roosevelt. Do you think that without it, the, the Germans would have won in the East? Um, would the Germans have won? No, they, uh, the Germans had already essentially lost in the East by the time that um, the... Uh, uh, the Second Front was established. The, uh, the first timetable that was drawn up foresaw a Second Front in 1943. Uh, we weren't able to perform that, uh, to fulfill that promise. And it's in 1943, uh, first with Stalingrad, which was a sort of great psychological victory, the first time the uh, the Wehrmacht was um, soundly beaten. Uh, and then, uh, second, the Battle of Kursk, which I think is the key battle of the war, where the Ra Red Army destroyed the Germans' tank force. After that, the Wehrmacht was incapable of mounting a major offensive again. Um, and that was all over by the summer of 1943. From then on, um, the, the Soviets were heading for Berlin uh, and the various things the Western powers were doing were not insignificant but were not key to that central operation. Sir, yes, at the back. I agree with your conclusions about Russia. Yeah? Uh, you know, being the uh, primary victor in Europe, how much did American Lend Lease contribute to, toward that victory? Thank you. Um, uh, in the field of military supplies and production and so on, there were two miracles. Uh, one uh, was in the United States, which from quite a low starting point produced this colossal, munificent torrent of, of goods which went to all the Allies. Uh, the other mir miracle was in the Soviet Union, <laughs> which... Um, Many of the uh, prime industrial areas of the Soviet Union, particularly in Ukraine, were overrun uh, in 1941. And so large numbers of Soviet factories had to be moved, lock, stock and barrel, with, you know, with all their equipment, all their people, thousands of miles in some cases, to Siberia, to the uh, Kuzbas or to the Urals and so on. And yet they succeeded in producing huge numbers of very good tanks, very good guns, Katyusha rockets, um, and that Soviet miracle was producing effects before Lend-Lease really began to bite. Um, uh, I say the, um, 
In military terms, the critical moment was in the summer of 1943. And American Lend-Lease, important though it was, only really came on full stream in 43 to uh, 44. So, and this is an ironic conclusion you can um, contemplate on your way home. American Lend-Lease uh, probably was decisive in enabling Stalin to run over, over on Eastern Europe in 1944 to 45, but not to fight the key battles, the Battle of Warsaw in uh, Battle of Moscow, December uh, 41, Stalingrad, of course, in 42, 42, yeah. Ironically, but that's how I think it was. Um, gentleman at the back, yes. Has anybody thought of the answers to the three questions yet? I just uh, have one question to ask you about the role of uh, Russia or the Soviet Union yeah. in the United States' goal of defeating the Japanese. Yeah. Obviously, it was in the U.S.'s interest to keep, and, and t until the atomic bomb, to keep Russia to the fire in terms of invading the Japanese for us. Right. So that, yes, we may have decided not to lose tr troops fighting a useless fight against a very powerful enemy that had already taken over Eastern Europe because we needed the Soviet Union, we thought, to conquer Japan. Yeah. Uh, I would strongly agree with, with that uh, analysis. Um, uh, uh, my friends from Eastern Europe are always bitterly complaining that they were sold down the river at Yalta to, um, to Stalin. And I, in a very real sense, I think they were. But the the prime concern of Roosevelt in his last months was to ensure that Soviet manpower would be transferred to the Far East. Um, the, the Americans, as you know, before the atom bomb uh, was known to, to work, were expecting to lose a million lives in the final attack against the J Japanese islands. Uh, and the only um, aid and assistance to them in that terrible task was the Red Army. So um, when Stalin agreed to participate in the war against Japan, he agreed at Yalta. Once he'd done that, Roosevelt was not going to argue about uh, Eastern Europe or other things which in the American interests were definitely secondary. Of course, if you came from Eastern Europe, <laughs> you had a different view. Uh, the gentleman uh, at the back there. Yes, uh, I, it, it was the first time I thought of it. Um, uh, I've always been told that France and England uh, joined, uh, uh, declared the war against Germany because Germany invaded Poland. Why didn't they declare a war against Russia if Russia uh, uh, invaded at the same time? Um, <clears throat> very good question, and I, um, I have talked um, to the late um, Sir Frank Roberts, who was the British diplomat in 1939, who had the job of talking to the Polish ambassador who came to him on the 17th of September and said, Great Britain has guaranteed Poland's independence. Uh, you declared war against Germany when Germany invaded. You will now please uh, declare war against the Soviet Union, which is invaded from the east. And the answer was, a typical British deviousness, uh, we uh, guaranteed Poland's independence, but not her frontiers. <laughs> it, it's like the president of Iran, isn't it? 
Very slippery. Uh, yes, lady. How much, if any, credit would you give to the Soviet military strategy during World War II in accounting for their victory, or is it simply a matter of the huge volume of soldiers and manpower that they had that enabled them to win? Um, yes, thank you. It's um, an important point because the professional assessment of the Red Army at the beginning of the war is that all it had is numbers. Uh, it uh, was thought to have substandard equipment, poor training. Um, Stalin had been shooting his generals, as you know, the, something 75% of the higher officers were killed at the beginning of the war. You know. How could an outfit really pull itself together and yet it did, and uh, I think it, um, it's, it's simply wrong to, to say that the, the uh, you'll note I never used the word Russia, because the Russians were only 55% of this outfit. Um, uh, the, the Soviets um, uh, did have the numbers. Uh, they had something like 400 divisions as opposed to less than 100 in the, in the U.S. Army. The, the British fielded 28 divisions. You know? The Germans had 230. And you can say some divisions were bigger than others, but the, the, the numbers are just colossal. They had a huge advantage of numbers. And, of course, they didn't, they weren't squeamish at, at at losing them. Uh, they quite deliberately uh, used men to, to clear minefields. To, um, they calculated in cold blood that they would lose three soldiers for every German soldier they killed and still come out on top. Uh, and it was quite clear that was how they operated. They shot, can you imagine this statistic? They shot more of their own soldiers in order to encourage the others than the British Army lost in the whole of the Western Campaign. Okay, you see that this frightening machine, that, that, but it was effective. But it, it wasn't only effective because of numbers. Uh, they had excellent equipment. You know, the, to everybody's amazement, the Soviet Union produced the best tank of the war. The T-34 could stand up to the tank, the, the Panzers, whereas the Shermans and the Churchills couldn't. They produced wonderful guns. The, Russia, is, Russia is like, his, the Russian Empire had a long tradition of artillery, wonderful. These Katyusha rockets, um, probably the, the most effective offensive weapon. Uh, field weapon of the war. Um, they produced rather good aeroplanes. They, they lost, um, I think it's true, more aeroplanes in 1941 than the whole of the British Air Force in total. And yet they recovered and by the end of the war they were producing rather good uh, warplanes of their own. So uh, they also had rather good generals. Um, which is not a small consideration. Um, uh, if you look at the, uh, the generals of the Second World War, I think there's only General Patton on the Western side, which would be in the, the first class. Um, there's half a dozen of, the, of these Soviet generals. Look at Rosok Rokossovsky, right? He was in the Gulag in 1939. It was absolute miracle that he survived. Um, he actually spent four years in the Gulag. Most people only survive for one winter. And he was brought out of the, the Gulag. He was sent to the Crimea for six weeks to get a few vitamins in him. And then he was sent to the front. Uh, and he performed mi miracles in one operation of which you've probably never heard, Operation Bagration. 
in the spring of 1944, Rokossowski destroyed, and I mean destroyed, more than 50 German divisions. That's the equivalent of the entire German deployment on the Western Front. Belarusia. Okay, it's, it's, the, it's when the Soviet army already had the advantage and they, they pulverized the central section of the, uh, of the German lines. We hardly notice that. Um, the answer to the first question I gave you. D-Day isn't even in the top ten battles. Like it's just not on the scale. Yes. The Soviet by the Germans. The, uh, the histories say that Stalin was incapacitated um, f uh, during the first part of the invasion. Is this correct, or was it an, a, an attempt to draw the Germans into the interior of Russia? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, uh, was he incapacitated? Uh, he, he, he disappeared. Uh, the usual explanation is that he had a nervous breakdown. Um, what that means, I, I don't know, whether he, he, he was ill. It's very unlikely that the, in a system where, in a dictatorship, where the, the top man decides everything of importance, that in a situation where the com country is being invaded, that he would pull out for a week or two, um, to take a rest, you know. Um, it's just highly unlikely. So um, it's also, I think, um, uh, a bit fantastic to think that this was a very clever ploy to, uh, to let the world think that he'd been beaten. No, I, um, but I don't know. I've, uh, I've not seen any de uh, you know, detailed analysis of that. But there are, incidentally, lots of... Um, archives in, in, now in Russia, which uh, Soviet archives, which had never been looked at. Um, um, I had a go uh, in Moscow and I, I find a few things that I wanted, but the usual response was yet, you know. <laughs> Sir, well, it's, First of all, I want to thank you very much for an incredibly informative lecture. Mm -hmm. I would hope that every American history teacher at the high school level would use a lot of the information that you offered us this evening. Because most American kids feel that we won the war. They know nothing about what Russia contributed. You point out 80% of the Losses on the side mm -hmm. of the Germans were inflicted by the Russians on the Eastern Front. The Soviets. <laughs> I'd also like to point out something. As a young kid in the Navy during World War II in the Pacific in June of 1944, operating up and down the New Guinea coast as part of MacArthur's fleet before we headed north to the Philippines. We knew very little about the invasion. It didn't mean a damn thing to us. I was way to hell over that way, and we were fighting a war in the Pacific. Never knowing when we'd ever get home again, if it hadn't been for dropping the A-bomb, I think it would have been out there for another year. As you pointed out, the American military establishment estimated about one million American casualties. You mentioned one million dead. Maybe that's over and above what they figured. But they figured if we ever had to go into Japan, the guys who were in Europe when the war had ended were slated to go to the Pacific. And when they found out that we dropped the A-bomb, and then when Japan surrendered, they thanked God that we had done that. There's still many Americans wonder, why did we drop the A-bomb? Why couldn't we continue a normal war and then defeat the Japanese? Mm -hmm. You've answered the question. Thank you, yes. <laughs> so, um, this lady, yes. Could you speak a little bit about the Katyn, is the same right, massacre and 
I'm not sure. What, what year was it? It was... Um, 1940. So how, why was it in the midst of this, at that point, the Poles were technically the allies of the Russians? No. No, not, not at all. They were, um, but how they took the time to kill all the Polish cavalry, all the Polish officers in the midst of their needs for, yeah. you know, their aggression elsewhere? Okay. Um, th this, is, to me, is one of the trou really troubling ep episodes of the war. Um, not only because it was a horrific massacre. Can you imagine what the world would think if 25,000 American officers had been murdered in cold blood? The world would know about it. Uh, these men happened to be Polish officers. They were our allies. Uh, at the beginning of the war, the United States was not involved and uh, for 45 years until Gorbachev came along and provided the documents and said yes this was the work of Stalin's police the Western world didn't want to know and this is another thing about the good war um, this is something that happened to an allied army let me explain the circumstances Poland is a square, it's invaded from the west by the Germans and from the east by the Soviets. It's divided down the middle and the, the Wehrmacht and the Red Army hold a joint victory parade. Have you ever seen pictures of that? There's a film of it, but they don't show it because it's so embarrassing to the whole Allied cause. Okay. The both sides take uh, huge numbers of Polish prisoners. Uh, the Germans, for whatever reason, treat their Polish prisoners, military prisoners, quite well. They put them in regular prisoner of war camps and almost all those guys survive the war. On the other side, in the Soviet Union, Stalin's police um, round up uh, more than a quarter of a million prisoners, they pick out the officers and they shoot them in cold blood. The guys that committed that crime, we know who their names are, they're old men now, but some of them are still alive in Moscow and nobody has thought of, well, the Poles think of it. But nobody can persuade uh, the Russians even to treat this as a crime. Um, it took 45 years for most of the, uh, the mass graves to be found. But one mass grave with four and a half thousand bodies was found by the Germans in 1943 um, when they were occupying the Western Soviet Union. Um, and of course Goebbels then made a great song of dance, showed these pictures and said this is what the Soviet Union does. It was one occasion when Goebbels didn't lie, he didn't have to lie. But the whole of the Western world said Nazi propaganda, of course this crime was committed by, by the SS, it wasn't. Um, and this is a, as a moral problem that the, the, uh, the Soviet Union, who became our ally and was responsible for, primarily for the defeat of the Third Reich, was guilty of crimes, of, that, of many such crimes, I mean, only one. Um, it looks to me, and this is in the field of speculation because um, nobody has found the re relevant documents in Germany, but the SS and, the, and Stalin's uh, police um, were partners. And uh, there were meetings in Poland where they coordinated um, tactics. And uh, the Nazis, of course, had uh, a 
policy, not only to kill Jews, but to kill the entire educated intelligentsia of Poland. Uh, and it looks as though Stalin had the same idea. Because at exactly the same period, this is March and April 1940, the SS started rounding up Polish professors, teachers, doctors, priests, that sort of people, and shooting them in cold blood. Uh, Glee, my father-in-law, who was sent to Dachau. Um, and at the same time, Stalin's police were rounding up these people who we now see as the victims of Katyn. Incidentally, 11,000 of those victims were civilians. Everybody says officers. But um, a lot of the people that were killed were lawyers, teachers, professors, that sort of people. Um, terrible episode, um, uh, as I say, not because in Stalin's scale shooting 25,000 people was a, you know, the biggest uh, item on the agenda, but because it's been denied for so, for so long. And it, it's here. Given what you've said about the state of the uh, British military and the need for the United States to concentrate largely on the Pacific, can you come up with a diff different scenario that would have produced a different result? Um, Well, all I can say is that various scenarios were floating around. Uh, the most obvious one was that the Second Front should be, have been started earlier. But the British and the Americans had a, a very particular problem which the Soviets didn't have, and that is that their only remaining base was on an island called Great Britain. Um, not England, incidentally, like uh, the Soviet Union wasn't Russia. Um, and in order to conduct any operation, whether it was the first Operation Torch in North Africa or then uh, Sicily or uh, the Normandy, uh, a huge amphibious force of ships, aeroplanes and, and ground troops had to be assembled. And this, w the logistics of that were mind-boggling. And I think there was this technical reason why the Western powers were inhibited in, um, in performing effectively or um, uh, as early as obviously they, they wanted to do. Uh, the other consideration is that for the United States forces to come to Britain in the first place, the Atlantic Ocean had to be cleared of U-boats. And it took until the summer of 19... May 1943 is the date when the Battle of the Atlantic was turned. The U-boats were never completely uh, defeated, but uh, the, the sea lanes were open from then on for American convoys and troop ships to come over and, of course... A couple of million men have been, uh, came over. Before that, they couldn't do it. <laughs> and that's exactly the time when the, the Red Army was beating the stuffing out of the, the Wehrmacht in the East. So, you, you had your hand up earlier. Have, have I an answered your question by mistake? <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah. No, I just wanted to... Um, many of your historians, they don't go far further back. And I'm wondering, uh, when I was a little boy, I remember the, uh, the war in Spain. It was uh, between the Loyalists and, I don't know, it was Franco mm -hmm. or whatever. And it seemed that the Germans came on one side and our sympathies was with, with another. And I'm just wondering, uh, they don't even teach this to, to kids anymore. They don't, they don't even know what I'm talking about right. when you're talking about the Franco, the uh, Spanish, Spanish War. The, uh, 
The Spanish Civil War, Civil right? War, yes. yes. Well, thank, thank you. That's um, a critical episode in my uh, mind. Um, uh, Franco was a fascist. Um, he uh, rebelled against the Spanish Republic, uh, and the Civil War was nicely balanced for a long time, for three years. Uh, Hitler sent reinforcements uh, to the fascists, and Stalin, of course, sent um, aid and assistance to the Republic. In fact, at the very end, uh, Stalin's people took over the, uh, the Spanish Republic. And to my mind, this was the period where people in Europe, but in the world in general, were trying to weigh up which is the bigger menace. <laughs> Uh, you've got these foul fascists on one hand, and you've got these foul communists on the other side. Um, they're both meddling in international affairs. Um, which do we regard as the, the main enemy? And my guess is that if the Spanish Republic dominated by 1939 by communists, had won the war, the world would have said, these are the prime enemies of civilization. These are the, the big threat. But it went the other way. Fa uh, Franco and his fascists won, and the Western world then said, these are the guys we've got to oppose. So you're quite right, a critical period. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you seem to have not spoken anything about Mussolini and Italy. Where do they sort of fit in the puzzle? Um, well, I like Italy, so... Uh, <laughs> um, um, Mussolini, uh, in fact, war, uh, possessed a rather large army. Uh, a powerful navy, which was the premier um, naval force in the Mediterranean, uh, an army. Um, uh, the trouble was the Italians didn't want to fight for him. Um, uh, unlike Germany, which where um, the nation kept fighting right to the bitter end, it's evident that the, uh, the Italians had no stomach for the, the various uh, mad designs that um, Mussolini had for them. So um, the result was the Italians played a much smaller part in the whole story than they might otherwise have done. Um, I only have a minute to say it, but uh, that's how... I think it was a question of morale, not a question of, um, of numbers or preparation or training or whatever. Um, in the First World War, uh, the Italians performed brilliantly. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, with great uh, resolution and courage, and but in the Second World War they didn't. Um, the, the tragic story, you know, the uh, Italian Mussolini sent large number, several hundred thousand, of Italian soldiers to the Eastern Front, and when um, Mussolini was deposed in 1940. Uh, the Italian army stopped fighting in the east. So the SS rounded them up and shot them. Well, one of the, uh, as it were, touchstones of these totalitarian powers is how they treat their allies. No, no compunction of the SS of shooting their own allies, but Stalin was the same. Do you know that Stalin murdered four million of his own men at the end of the war. Uh, these are men who'd been, I'm sorry, I say four million. Uh, there, were, there were five million Soviet soldiers who were prisoners in Germany. The SS didn't even put them in concentration camps. They just held them in the open until they started e eating each other. 
uh, and then they recruited some of them for concentration camp guards. You don't think any of these guys were volunteers in the normal sense. And by 1945, only one million of those five million were still alive. They, they were then taken back to the Soviet Union and Stalin shot or killed in the gulag all the people that had survived the SS camps. Can, can you get your head around that one? Uh, you know, people say, what had they done? They had the, they'd been abroad, that was enough. <laughs> so, yes. Considering the invasion of Norway, yeah? if, the, if the French and the British had come earlier into Norway, could they have stopped the German advance? Um... Uh, ifs and, and, and bots, you know. Um, historians are concerned with what actually happened, and we, we know that the, uh, the, the British and French, and, and of course a Polish, a couple of Polish divisions went in there, but it, came, it was too late, too little. Um, uh, but there's a, a, another um, consideration. Uh, the Germans had a great advantage on the continent. The British and the French would have to have supplied this if they'd established their bridgehead, you know. The, the, the supply, the ships would have had to come across the, the, the North Sea and it's doubtful whether they could have uh, uh, held on to, to that uh, for any length of time. But stranger things happen. One, one of the, you know, the um, essential things of this war, as almost any war, is that surprising things happen. You know, people make calculations, general, generals make plans, and almost always they go wrong. <laughs> and there are consequences, unforeseen cons consequences uh, uh, of, um, of events. And... Um, you get these strange results which, uh, you know, not, not, um, weren't foreseen and are sometimes hard to believe when you actually read what's happened. Well, there's, yes, uh, I've had several on this side. All right then, sir, yes, at the back. Did you see the movie Downfall and what did you think of it? Uh, I didn't, unfortunately. But I, I, um, I heard the, 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 I've seen one or two clips uh, and the, the actor playing Hitler was, was brilliant and was uh, um, very convincing and uh, there was this wonderful comment that the, that actor made Hitler seem too human. Well, he was human. <laughs> alas, uh, alas, you know, that's humankind that comes in all so sorts. Um, uh, yeah, um, what, what is... Um, no, no, I, I, I think any medium from poetry to films to novels to anything which um, conjures up a, the spirit of some period or event is, is most welcome. Um, you know, what is killing are these dry as dust accounts where, as it were, hu hum humanity isn't suffering and triumphing. You know, there's the emotional element which is so important in war is, is, is absent. Um, uh, but uh, in, as it were, our Western stereotypes, all our negative emotion of what was nasty, horrible, um, uh, evil is poured into uh, Hitler and the Third Reich for, for obvious reasons. And I, um, I sometimes wish that the picture was a bit bigger. Um, but uh, Stalin was an evil monster and um, he didn't make as many mistakes as, as Hitler did. You know his famous comment that uh, 
Anton Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, went to Moscow in 1941 to begin the uh, attempts to, to form the Grand Alliance. And he, uh, he had Stalin um, uh, in, a, in a room, as it were, where they could talk in private. And he said, um, you know, Mr. Stalin, uh, do you mind telling me how many people were killed in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And Stalin looked at him and he said, I don't know, perhaps 10 million, but you have to know when to stop. <laughs> and It might be better if you work it out for yourselves. <laughs> Norman Davies is the author of several books, including Europe, A History, and Rising 44, The Battle for Warsaw. For more on No Simple Victory, visit the publisher at penguin.com.